From the time that I was first elected in 1979, um, I, I knew that I wanted to speak out on equality for the um, LGBT community. Um, and so I, I did that. I was a member of the Constitution Committee, the committee that wrote the Charter of Rights. Um, in 1981, uh, I moved an amendment to the Charter to include sexual orientation in the Charter of Rights in 1981, which was pretty revolutionary back then. It was defeated 22 to two. Um, uh, and, uh, and I spoke out strongly. I started tabling bills to to end discrimination based on sexual orientation. So folks across the country knew that, that I was, even though I wasn't out myself at that point, they knew that, that, that I had their back and that this was somebody that was prepared to speak out. So, so very early on, uh, I started hearing from people, people in the military, people in the RCMP, um, families of people who had died, who committed suicide, chaplains in the Canadian military who talked to me about the devastation uh, of the lives of people that were affected by the purge. So from, from a very early point, from the early 80s, uh, I started meeting with people, battling with the government bureaucracy, with the Canadian Armed Forces and so on. Um, but of course, you know, there was complete impunity. The law was the law and uh, they, they kicked people out and there was absolutely no recourse. I mean, because at that point there was no human rights protection. What happened was in 1985, the new conservative government appointed a special committee, the Equality Rights Committee, to look at what's the meaning of Section 15 of the Charter, what laws have to be changed and so on, because there was a three-year delay in that section coming into force. Um, Mulroney had a massive majority, said there were five conservatives on the committee, one liberal, Sheila Finestone, and myself representing the NDP, seven member committee, chaired by Patrick Border. Um, and I went to John Crosby, the Minister of Justice, and I said, look, would you also agree to, to, to let this committee uh, study my bill to end discrimination based on sexual orientation? Because they're gonna hold hearings across the country and that's a human rights issue. And I talked to Mulroney as well, the prime minister, and they said, okay, you know what? Yes, we'll agree. So my bill went to that committee as well. And what that, meant was that that committee then held hearings across the country and it was the first time ever that a parliamentary committee gave a, a platform to people to tell their stories and at every stop across the country i made sure that people from the lgbt community were there to meet with the committee to tell their stories sometimes it was confidential one of the most senior rcmp officers i'll never forget was in tears in a hotel in downtown Toronto, um, meeting with us uh, in confidence, telling us about the, uh, the, the, the impact of, the, of, of, of this, the fear of, of being outed and what that would do to his career. We met with Darrell Wood, a, a survivor um, uh, who was uh, kicked out in uh, Nova Scotia and others. Long story short, the committee was deeply moved by, by what they heard and what I made sure they heard uh, at every stop. And amazingly enough, the committee unanimously recommended, so five conservatives unanimously recommended that we end all discrimination. The purge was wrong, it was discriminatory, and that we end all discrimination based on sexual orientation. That was in late 1985. March 4th of 1986, John Crosby announced on behalf of the government that they accepted our recommendation and that all discrimination based on sexual orientation would end in federal jurisdiction. Well, this was a conservative government. And I mean, many of us were kind of stunned. And of course, the head of the military, uh, Eric Nielsen was the Minister of Defense, was outraged. The head of the military, the CDS was outraged. Uh, Simmons, the commissioner of the RCMP was, was absolutely appalled at this, but the government was on record. And most importantly, and in terms of, of, of the future for people fighting the purge, the, the government accepted that section 15 of the charter did, did prohibit discrimination based, based on sexual orientation. So that was huge because from that day forward until today, we have a constitution that prohibits discrimination. Every government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to accept basic equality. And in fact, benefits were, were not even an issue until the mid nineties. Um, uh, what was the issue in, 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 in the eighties and post charter was just the right to not to be fired from your job. In 1989, the year after I came out, a young woman named Michelle Douglas came to see me and she started on a journey with me and with Clayton Ruby to whom I introduced her that led to the federal court saying, 
that this is illegal. And that was the end of legal discrimination in the military. We went to the Security Intelligence Review Committee, challenged the denial of our security, security clearance. We won there. Then we went to the federal court. We won. Um, I mean, Michelle is a hero uh, in, this, in this battle. And it didn't just stop there. She went on to be the, the head of the Campaign for Equal Families, which was the, the group that was, I think it was actually, she was the foundation, the head of the, the foundation, which was the group that fought for equal marriage rights. And that was sort of in the mid nineties and up until about 2005. And then it took another decade, another decade until the liberals came into power. Again, Justin Trudeau, 2015. And Trudeau to his credit um, said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna do the right thing here. What, what happened here was, was outrageous. And I mean, even Brian Mulroney, I, I, I questioned Mulroney in 1992 about the purge and, and it's all on the record. And, and he said, this was, this was an outrage what happened, but, but that was 1992. So it took another almost 20, 20 years. And, 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 and Justin Trudeau to his credit said, we're gonna, we're gonna try to do right by these people. And, and he appointed a small group of people to, to draft an apology. I was, I was one of those people that he appointed to, to draft the apology along with people who were victims of the purge uh, that, were, that were part of our, the, the committee that drafted the apology. He made that apology in parliament as prime minister. It was one of the most moving days in parliament. I was of course in the gallery with many of the victims of the purge, including Michelle and, and others. Um, uh, and uh, uh, as he made that apology, it was a lot of tears and, and, and a lot of emotion. And I was thinking of course about people who weren't able to be there some of those people that had committed suicide, whose, whose lives were shattered and destroyed by this purge. There's a special committee, the purge committee set up and guess who's chairing that committee? It's Michelle Douglas, who chairs that committee along with other members of the purge. Um, uh, Todd Ross, Martin Waugh, uh, Wayne Davis from the RCMP, uh, all incredible people who are uh, now um, helping to make sure that the story is told uh, of what happened. So it's, um, it's taken a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of anguish. Um, but at the end of the day, there's been a recognition by the government uh, of the wrongdoing and, and, and making available, although it's been a tough battle, making available all the documents to tell the story uh, of what actually happened and hopefully to share these lessons with, with other countries who are going through the same kind of thing. I totally understand and respect the perspective of people who say, look, um, you know, words uh, are, are, are important, but we want to see not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. Uh, and, and I understand and respect that. But having said that, words also are very powerful. And when the prime minister of your country in parliament uh, says what happened here was, was terribly wrong, we are deeply sorry, this will never happen again. I think for the vast majority of those who, who were victims of the purge, I think that was significant and, and meaningful and hopeful. Was it enough? Absolutely not. There's still, of course, more work to be done. Uh, the Marie Deschamps report um, uh, eloquently documents some of the, the real battles that are still going on within the military. The sexism, the misogyny, it's incredible. And not just Deschamps report, but as we know, just up until, uh, up until the present time. Um, but that doesn't in any way, in my view, diminish the significance of a government saying what we did was wrong. We are going to compensate to the extent possible, the victims of this. Um, I think that's very important. And, and I guess the only other point I would make in response to that is, have there been changes in the military and the RCMP? You bet there have. There have been huge changes. And there's a, 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 a vigorous policy of, of calling out any form of, of open homophobia, transphobia, and so on. There are openly trans members of, of the military, of the RCMP, who are welcomed and accepted. Is there work to be done? Absolutely. But I think if we, when you compare where we were at uh, in 1985, or when Michelle Douglas came to see me at Ryerson University, and after what she'd been through, hooked up to a lie detector test and so on, we've made massive progress. And I think we should celebrate that. I think it's incredibly important that, that Canadians, especially young Canadians, 
know the story of what happened because I, I continue to be astonished when I when I tell people about what happened. Uh, they say, no, but in Canada, this is unthinkable. Um, I've been teaching at Simon Fraser University this year and I invited Michelle Douglas to speak to my class. And we showed some video from, from back in the, in the 80s and so on. And my students who are most, most of them in their 20s were, were just staggered. They said, this is just unbelievable. They didn't know that this had gone on as part of our history. It's, it's similar to some of the, the absolutely uh, the absolute anguish and pain that, that so many of us and the shame that so many of us feel around residential school stories. I mean, you know, we're, we're discovering the horrors, I mean, with the, with the, 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 the children, the, the graves of, of children and so on. But this is another part of that dark history of Canada that Canadians must know. And so a key element of, of my work now uh, as one of the elders in the community, I guess, who lived through that period and who was actively engaged in, in fighting this. And, and I know that other victims of the purge feel the same way, many of them who, who are of, of my generation. We have to share these stories. And, we, and, and in order to do that effectively, we also want to make sure that we have full access to all of the, the, the truths. Um, so, you know, the stories about the fruit machine that Sarah Foti documented so powerfully in, 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 her, in her video and so on, in her film. Um, these are stories that Canadians have to hear and I am committed and I'm working now with the Purge Committee to do everything I can to make sure that these stories are told. What about those other countries in which this is still happening, that hopefully we can, we can be advocates for global justice as well? We've learned some lessons in Canada. Let's share those lessons with the world.